Good morning and welcome to St. Columba by the Lake Presbyterian Church. Bienvenue à St. Columba. We're so glad that you have joined us both in person and at home and in your communities. This is April 11th, 2021, the second Sunday in Easter, and we hope that you feel the hope and love of God as we worship together. 25 people are now allowed for in-person worship, and you need to sign up ahead of time and are now required to wear a procedural mask. Uh, but we do have some here, and we're glad to provide one for you when you arrive. You are invited also to join us for Zoom coffee hour at 1 p.m. today, no masks required. And the link was sent out in news. Thanks to Cheryl Doxis for sharing her creativity and spirituality moment today. If you have found that the arts or music in any way has inspired you during the past months and years, or if you found a way to be creative that is meaningful, like cooking or gardening or painting or playing music, uh, please consider sharing it with us, as Cheryl will today, and contact Michael. Um, you could speak in person or send a video or write something. We are grateful to Charlotte Adams, our soloist this morning. And our sympathy is extended to the family of the Reverend Dr. Harry Kuntz, who died last Sunday. Our prayers are with his wife Joanne and his four children. Harry Kuntz was the pastor of St. Columba from 1965 to 1971. He was a lifelong learner and educator and minister in association at Briarwood Presbyterian Church. A private memorial service will take place on Tuesday and a live stream link can be accessed through the Collins Funeral Home website. So let us take a deep breath now and prepare our hearts and minds, our bodies and our spirits for worship. Please join me in the responsive call to worship found in your service outline or on the screen. In the Eastern newness and resurrection, there is hope and possibility. In the Easter freedom and joy, there is liberation and creativity. In the Easter alleluias and amens, there is grace and power. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Let us worship God.
O radiant light, O flame divine, as shines the light of morning's dawn, come bless the embers of the earth, sparks flung from our eternal birth. O word of God, the source of life, you rouse us from the night of fears to open souls and minds and ears and hear the music of the spheres. You are the fire that birthed all things, the force that spins the galaxies. You are the flame within all flames, the hidden power that knows no name. From you all things that are were sent, and into you does all extend. Peel back the bark of any tree, lift up a stone, they blaze with thee. O oh, happy light, we feel your heat, the starlight shining in our bones. You fill us all with cosmic grace, we host your presence in this place. O risen Christ, you shine in us. O radiant light, O flame divine, O risen Christ, shine in us. The radiance of your holiness, despite the sting of death and strife, We rise to dance. This dance of life. We went quite willingly because we, as we aged, we loved the art. But most likely when we were young, really young, it was because there was always an ice cream treat at the end. George and I raised Jim and Chester this way, too, as we both believed an art education is part of a great education. It was at the New York City World's Fair in 1964 that I first saw Michelangelo's statue, La Pieta. As the crowd stood on slow-moving conveyor belts, there was hardly a sound in the room. The hushed crowd stared in awe at the beauty of the marble statue, depicting the Blessed Mother Mary cradling the dead body of her son. 
It was obvious that we were in the presence of greatness, but it wasn't until years later that I understood to what extent this greatness affected the world of art. In university, I took art history, basically because it fit into my schedule, but it turned out that it was one of the best courses I ever took. My childhood trips paid off as a base for art appreciation. Many of us will remember in 1972, the statue was damaged in an attack by a man wielding a hammer. A few years later, it was almost seamlessly repaired using the pieces that had been broken off. Fast forward several decades, and I had the chance to visit with the La Pieta again. This was where the magic really began. By this time, I had read about the work. It's carved out of a single hunk of Carrera marble, handpicked by Michelangelo himself. This truly is like our theme, unlocking the possibilities. In fact, Michelangelo believed that God directed his hand to chip away the marble that was not needed. That certainly allows the possibility to emerge. Originally, it was commissioned to adorn the tomb of a French cardinal stationed in Rome. In 1499, he hired Michelangelo to create, quote, the most beautiful work of marble in Rome, one that no living artist could better, unquote. I think it's safe to say that challenge was fulfilled. Interestingly, it's the only sculpture that Michelangelo ever signed. He did this because while viewing it, he heard someone give credit to another sculptor, so he chiseled his name onto the sash of Mary's robe. It's said that he regretted this show of vanity and he never signed another piece of his work. Now, I think it's amazing to know he created this masterpiece at the age of 23. Imagine, age of 23. I look back remembering what I had accomplished by the age of 23. Well, many things, but certainly nothing like this. I think one can relate to Michelangelo, not in terms of talent, but in terms of wonder. Luckily, life contains many instances of wonder but somehow this wondrous work seems easy to relate to. My third chance to spend time with this statue was the most memorable of all for me. It was early in the morning. George and I arrived as soon as the Vatican Museum opened. A few others were there. We went straight to the statue. We saw a very young Mary's serene face conveying her pain. It struck me that she seemed to be swaddling Jesus in the cloth of her robe, much the same way as she had swaddled him at his birth. There she was, a mother and her son. Her grief and compassion were palatable. I wished that I could have communicated with her and to tell her that she was not alone. The world grieved too. I find it hard to believe that the hand of God did not play a role in the creating of this statue. If God had commissioned this work, this is the statue he would have described to Michelangelo. God might have said, carve a statue that shows a grieving mother as she cradles her son for the last time. Show the world that although human, these two are divine. I hope to have a chance to see this remarkable work of art again. Although the statue obviously remains the same, the viewer does not. And each visit to a piece of art reveals new insights, new possibilities. To witness genius is remarkable. To allow it to affect your life is a privilege.
The first scripture reading this morning is from Acts chapter 10, verses 34 to 43. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all that who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear not to all people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Our second reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he has said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the marks, of the nails in his hands and put my fingers in the marks of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus is risen from the grave. Jesus is risen from the grave. Jesus is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Jesus was seen by Mary. Jesus was seen by Mary. Jesus was seen by Mary. Hallelujah. Thomas will stop his doubting. Thomas will stop his doubting. Thomas will stop his doubting. Hallelujah. 
In the name of God, our creator, Jesus, our redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our sustainer. Amen. Remember long ago the joy of being able to be together when we could freely gather without thinking about it? Remember the times we took for granted when there were no constraints on weddings, baptisms, or graduations? We miss that. And we look forward to when that time will happen again. If we attended those particular events, a wedding, a graduation, a baptism, as a friend of the family, it may have been the joyful celebration of a child we had watched grow up, a closing chapter in a way for us. After the event, we may have lost track of them except for the occasional update. But of course, for the people who were being celebrated, the graduate, the newly married spouse, the new parents, it was only the beginning of the journey. Eastertide is a season because one day isn't enough for the Easter proclamation of new life. It is a season because the empty tomb is not the end of the story. We are so quick to proclaim Christ is risen, we forget that after the empty tomb there was fear and confusion. After the empty tomb, there were still those broken relationships between Jesus and his followers after they abandoned him and denied him. And there was no clear way forward. So our creative God needed to find a way to rebuild community after this isolating time. And that's what those strange resurrection appearances are all about. We'll be reading them over the next few weeks, these stories of rebuilding trust and rebuilding community. Because after that empty tomb, Jesus' followers kept having experiences about him over the next few weeks. Rowan Williams calls them painfully untidy stories. In some ways, they are a little strange. But in each one, the risen Jesus finds ways to meet his followers where they are, to rebuild relationships, and to unlock new possibilities. For Thomas, the story wasn't finished. He was overcome with grief. And we can imagine that he was the practical one. You know, the one who is able to go out beyond the isolation and buy the groceries and find out what is going on beyond the four walls you live in. But it was while he was away that Jesus met the other disciples in a locked room. He breathed on them the Holy Spirit, saying, Peace be with you, and he began to unlock new possibilities. So when Thomas returns, his friends proclaim, We have seen the Lord. But without the experience they had, Thomas can't grasp it. A story, even told by those you trust, wasn't enough to overcome his grief and longing to be with his teacher and friend. When Jesus returns a week later, notice that the doors are still closed. It is hard to know when it is safe to unlock our doors. But Jesus came to Thomas where he was and gives him what he needs to trust and hope to begin to rebuild their relationship. He offers Thomas what he demanded, to see the holes in his hands and touch, to put his hands in his side. But like a child who makes very specific demands, it wasn't really what he needed. Despite all the artwork to the contrary, the story doesn't say that Thomas did his own autopsy, sticking his hand in Jesus' side. Like the times we demand, in times of grief and pain and anger, Thomas didn't really need proof. He needed presence. And that's what Jesus gave him 
his entire and complete self. And Thomas was so overwhelmed by that loving presence that he forgets to reach out and touch. He forgot what he demanded and simply confesses, my Lord and my God. Thomas remembered who he was, a follower of Jesus, and he remembered who God was, a loving divine presence that overcomes death and loss. Slowly but surely, new possibilities are being unlocked, just as those followers may soon be ready to unlock their physical door and go out into the world. Our ministry together here at St. Columba, our community, is all about unlocking new possibilities. Because no matter what happens in our crazy world, God is always seeking to meet us where we are, to work through us to bring peace to any fear or pain. God seeks to nurture our spirits and rebuild that holy relationship or connection so that new possibilities may come to light for us and for those around us. You've heard that during March, the creative creating our way through study group met and we talked about all the different ways we can be creative and how that creativity unlocks a different part of us allowing us to connect with our spirit i don't mean that you have to be a beautiful painter or the best cook or an exquisite gardener but i mean that when we create when we brainstorm or write or play music, when we paint or cook or garden for pleasure, when we look at art or enjoy music, we nurture our spirit and we may reconnect with the divine. Creating in God's image, there are not some people who are creative and others who aren't. I used to think that. We, but we are a reflection of God's image. So all of us are creative, ready to learn and create in different ways, ready to appreciate creativity. As Rene August says in the film we watched describing the indescribable, any kind of art invites us into a conversation where our words have very little value, and so we enter silently. We have to shut up and listen. You have to be open. You have to stop and look deeply. It engages all my senses. How else do you engage with a God who is indescribable? And so it invites me into mystery, into different interpretations, and is a reminder of beauty. Have you ever noticed that a photo or a painting or a beautiful piece of music helps you to remember a story in your life or a deep feeling you've kept buried? It may stir a longing for something you've always wanted to do, a way you've always wanted to share your gifts, or recall a relationship you've always wanted to nurture. Marlon Hall says in the film Amnesia Amnesia Therapy, that art helps us to re-remember things we have forgotten or lost through pain. The beauty of art helps us to re-remember, to remember love again, or hope, or beauty, or grace. Art helps us to re-remember that our soul exists for love. There may be some things we need to re-remember as we slowly come out of isolation. And perhaps art and music and literature and poetry can help us. They may be some of the ways God comes to us as they help us to re-remember beauty and love and hope. They may help us to re-remember who we are. As Jesus did with his followers after his death and resurrection, God comes to us when we are weighed down with responsibility and with worry and grief, and helps us to re-remember hope, to re-remember that we are God's beloved. 
Our creativity and spirituality are not separate. They feed one another and nurture one another. We don't need to be the best at something creative in order for it to be meaningful. We just need to do it and try things and be open. As we look forward to all being together again someday, we'll need to do some rebuilding at St. Columba and in our families and our communities. We'll need to do some reconnecting of relationships We'll need to find creative ways to do that and to meet people where they are. And we'll do that together. But this week, I challenge you to begin to be a little creative. Don't worry about being the best. Simply do it for yourself and your spirit. Dig vegetables and get a, sorry, dig your hands in the ground and garden or do yard work. Chop some vegetables and get a dish simmering. Design something, build something, write something, or draw something. Play an instrument, sing a song, say a poem just for fun, or sing. Consider it an Eastertide spiritual practice. Maybe it will help us reconnect with the Holy One, because isolation never stops God from coming. The divine meets us where we are, meets us in our fear and brings peace. Our radiant God seeks to be in relationship with me and with you. So as you live, love, and serve, may we all re-remember love and hope so that you may have life in God's name. Thanks be to God. Amen. dawning of salvation in the morning of the world Christ is raised a living banner by the love of God unfurled through the daylight through the darkness Christ lead on his great array all the same and all the sinners he has gathered on his way. He is risen in the morning, he is risen from the dead. He is laughter after sadness, he is light when night has fled. He has suffered, he has triumphed, life is his alone to give. As he gave it, once he gives it, evermore that we may live. For our Easter prayer response, when I say the words, God of new life, please respond, hear us as we pray. Let us pray. Lord of such amazing surprises, as puts a catch in our breath and wings on our hearts, we praise you for this joy, too great for words, but not for tears and songs and sharing. We praise you for this yes to life and laughter, to love and to our unwinding selves. We give you thanks for possibilities unlocked. We praise you for no dead ends to growing, 
to choices, to calls to be just, to making peace, to dreaming dreams, and to being glad of heart. We praise you for this resurrection madness, for all the ways you breathe new life through us, calling us to explore, create, and play as we re-remember and rediscover your presence. God of new life, hear us as we pray. In yet another critical time of the pandemic, grant us courage and patience. Be with healthcare workers and all who do work that is essential for our life and well-being. Grant each one strength and moments of rest and joy. We pray for parts of our world where justice reigns unchallenged, O God, for the people of Myanmar and eastern Ukraine, for places where there is natural disaster for the people of St. Vincent, in places where there is, is inadequate access to health care amid high COVID numbers in Brazil and India. Bring peace and help. Guide world leaders to have the courage to speak for the vulnerable and to make decisions for the good of all. God of new life, hear us as we pray. God of healing, we pray for all who struggle all who are unemployed, and especially for all who are in dangerous or precarious situations at home. Shine your light in the darkness and unlock new possibilities. We pray healing and strength for people in our extended community who are sick this day. For Ross, Catherine Notley's brother in BC, as he has COVID in hospital. For Pat Gerard, Brian Warnock, and John Drinkle. We bring to you the Kunz family as they grieve. May each one know your peaceful presence and your hope. God of new life, hear us as we pray. Inspire us, creative God. Teach us how to open up, how to hum your frequency. Be with us in our chaotic messes as we co-create our way through life alongside you. As your people and as a community, help us to be shapeable, mendable, willing to come alive with you. All this we ask in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as you forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Bye. 
hearts of him. Lord of all to thee we raise this our sacrifice of praise. Please join me in the benediction responses. Like the women who shared the good news of the empty tomb, let us go, go forth, forth with, with joy. joy. Like the disciples receiving the Holy Spirit, let, let us, us go, go forth, forth with, with peace. And like Thomas filled with doubt, let us go, go forth, forth with, with faith, faith and new life. life. Go now with the blessings and peace of God, our creator, redeemer, and comforter, this day and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.